um, I haven't heard much talk about courage um, in uh, teachings, um, but it seems to me that in this in this time of turmoil and uncertainty, of danger, uh, it really takes a lot of courage. And as I thought about it, um, just con just continuing with our practice during this time takes a lot of strength and courage. So my talk is, I'm calling my talk, Cultivating and Embodying Courage, uh, the Role of Great Faith and Great Doubt. So the most usual definition of courage is um, taking action in the presence of fear or danger. Another way of looking at it is um, making a decision or taking action where risk is involved. The risk or the fear that comes with it could be real or imagined. It could be something that comes up in our minds. Uh, it could be something real. But courage really acts um, to help us grow um, because we turn towards rather than away and we learn how to be with the challenges that we face face and every day you know we're facing now always always <laughs> every minute we're facing um, all of these things but we're not always aware of it and right now um, there is a kind of heightened awareness a sense of um, something something nothing what how what how when when just complete um, being with that sort of that sort of in, environment. That's one of that's a condition of our lives. So when I look towards Zen practice, um, maybe the true meaning of courage is not really um, the absence of fear, but really the ability to be with and come through fear. So when I talked about faith, I talked about faith as a verb, faithing, faithing our practice. And I think courage is also a verb because you're couraging, right? You're couraging, you're engaged in couraging. So you have to practice your bravery and your courage by couraging one act at a time. So it, it really requires us to embrace, enter, permeate fear with openness and, um, and no expectation, no hope, just going along uh, through the fear, through the uncertainty. And in doing that, we have to, uh, in being in that fear, we, we really have to do that without um, without aversion to the fear, without aversion to what comes up in the fear, the details of the fear. And um, no attachment to anything being any different. We just have to be with that. That's the courage of Zen. So it's more than courage and extreme risks. It consists really to a greater degree of acts of everyday courage in the face of a kind of common, commonly, commonly encountered uh, experiences on our way, right? To, to respond to all of the challenging situations um, and, and not really, we're not really discriminating because the feelings that come up, the fear that comes up in these day-to-day -day situations, it may not be the same degree, but it certainly can be. And, it's, and, and it is something that we pay attention to. Uh, because it can, if we don't pay attention to it, it turns into anger and it turns into acting um, in, in unwholesome ways. A lot, a lot of the things we see now are really uh, coming from fear. A lot of actions are coming from fear and people not able to feel that fear and understand that fear. So I wanted to kind of, before I get into um, 
the uh, talking about how faith and uh, doubt help us with fear. I wanted to just be, be a little bit more granular about uh, the kind of what, what we mean by courage in, in a more granular way. So we usually think of physical courage and we think of extreme physical courage, like firefighters running into the, running into the uh, woods. Uh, but what about, <laughs> what about the physical courage of sitting zazen <laughs> and, ex and, ex and feeling extreme pain and discomfort? Um, and yet, uh, you know, taking a break, uh, and then when the clappers clap, going back and facing that pain, physical pain. That takes a kind of courage,ing a belief. It comes from a underlying uh, a desire to practice, uh, but it takes courage,ing to do that. Sometimes it just just takes courage,ing to walk in the door of Berkeley Zen Center, if it's a strange, alien place. It doesn't seem very welcoming. Or sometimes courage is joining in, but. Um, so that, uh, that physical courage um, can carry us well, especially the physical courage of facing um, old age, sickness, and death. Uh, that courage of uh, not being able to do the things we could do or suffering um, with physical disabilities uh, or mental deterioration and still day to day doing our life day-to-day -day practicing. So then there's social courage. And social courage is also something we don't think about a lot, but um, it's really familiar to us. Uh, it's, it's a kind of social embarrassment or social shame. And it's, it, it can be, um, shame coming from your own conditioning. So maybe you're uh, not feeling so good about yourself and so you're, you're ashamed of how you are, how you look, how you, um, how you are in, uh, with other people. You might be ashamed or fearful of raising your hand and asking a question. You might be afraid you're not gonna fit in to a social situation and so you hang back. So, Facing social courage is being able to enter a social situation with other people, upright, open, questioning, and without and, and letting go of those feelings of insecurity and shame. Another kind of, of uh, courage is intellectual courage. Now that's interesting. That's interesting to me. <laughs> it's a uh, it's the willingness to really engage in challenging ideas, to question our thinking, not, not to try to know everything, um, being willing to make mistakes. Every time we give a talk, in some case that takes, um, it takes intellectual courage and it takes a little audacity, you know, what do I know? We don't really know anything, so how am I going to give a talk about something without knowing where it's going, without knowing how it's gonna go, without knowing if what I say is, um, is quote unquote correct. Um, so it means for us, I would say, really, really having a big question mark and really listening with an open mind and a heart to a teaching, letting in something that might be challenging to the way we see things, the way we see the world, the way we've gone around understanding our Zen, Zen study and practice for a long time. That's the only way we can move, move on rather than getting stuck in fixed ideas and fixed thinking and mind getting, thinking too much of, of itself. And basically the slogan would be I could be wrong. I could be wrong and that's okay. The courage to have that not be okay. 
Then there's moral courage. And uh, moral courage is basically being upright, um, having a sense of ethics and morality, looking into what ethics and morality are, like we study the precepts, and study the karma of cause and effect. So we in BZC, we have a set of ethics guidelines. Moral courage is really looking at these ethics guidelines and these precepts and recognizing um, where our shortcomings might be or where we are not acting in, in concert with those in harmony with those precepts. Being able to, also it means being able to stand forward or step forward when something unwholesome or, uh, or, or unkind is happening, when we see precepts being broken, uh, being able to step forward, not necessarily with judgment, but with, um, with, a, with an uprightness and an openness and a, and a, and a compassion for each other, but also reminding ourselves, being able to remind ourselves and others that we do have this set of precepts, that, that they are part of our practice, that, that, we, um, that we actually depend on them in many ways. And the, when we don't, when we don't, when we forget, we have situations that everyone's heard about, about abbots who have been alcoholics or uh, sexually addicted um, or financially uh, dishonest. And the Sanghas had a hard time. Uh, and there was a lot of spiritual bypass, just that, well, that, that person who knows all of that who's so wise, who's so great a teacher. Well, they just have this one little thing. <laughs> and when that happens and when we don't stand up and we don't have the courage to stand up, great harm can happen, as it has done in many situations. So then um, the other, uh, another one is uh, emotional courage. And emotional courage is just knowing how to be with our feelings not being afraid of them. One of the greatest defense mechanisms that most of us use is repression or denial. And when you don't look, have the courage to look at those feelings and feel those feelings, then you, you don't, that nothing changes. Then you have a storehouse consciousness filled with all of these seeds of suffering from all of these emotions, these emotional situations that you haven't actually been with. So when you completely feel all of these feelings, all the anxiety, all the fears, all the, all the, all, all the uncertainties, all of the emotional stuff that comes up with that, um, then, then you kind of move from certainty about uh, how it is to doubt about how it is, starting to question your own, your own picture of things when you start looking deeply into these feelings. The last kind of courage is spiritual courage. And to me, spiritual courage is kind of, uh, do, do, we, do we grapple with the eternal uncertainty do we grapple with um, our, our beliefs? Um, do we enter the, the scary parts of spiritual practice to find the deep strength that helps us with all the other kinds of, of uncertainty or uh, needs for courage? For me, in, in, in Zen practice, it means being willing to start off in your, in your, in your uh, Zazen practice uh, start off by letting go of fear in zazen, 
and, and our whole zazen practice is about being able to be with that fear, to be able to go into the darkness of emptiness, because in the darkness of emptiness is where wisdom is born. So we have to have that spiritual courage to enter that space, that space of non-duality and dwell, and, and then return and dwell and then return, but looking with curiosity and being strong enough, having that courage to stay with it, knowing, uh, knowing, some, somehow knowing uh, that it's safe knowing that we can't be shaken. So that's a uh, kind of, uh, what, what should I call it, the kind of a rational way of looking. So I wanted to, uh, the other thing about courage is uh, where it is in the body. Mostly, uh, it's interesting because courage really, um, people, courage really is in the heart. You know, that's, that's a, that, that, that tells us something. Um, it's not in some place or the mind. Um, it is, comes from a place of, our, of compassion and openness and connectedness. That's how, that's how true courage is expressed. That's, how we, that's where we find what we need to be able to be courageous. So I have a great story I found um, about our uh, one of our earliest women ancestors, Upalavana. She was um, one of Buddha's two uh, chief nuns in his community. And we recite her name when we recite the names of the women ancestors here. So one day, <laughs> one day Upalavana went out into the wilderness and she wasn't wearing her priest robes. In one story, in one, one version of this, she was wearing a flowered blouse. I'm not sure how anybody got that, but uh, it, it, uh, it's interesting because uh, she's, she's in the wilderness by herself. And Mara, attempted to break her concentration. Mara appears and tells her she should be afraid of rogues as a beautiful woman sitting in the wilderness. Upalavana, having understood this is Mara, the evil one, replied in verse, though a hundred thousand rogues just like you might come here. I stir not a hair. I feel no terror. Even alone, even alone, Mara, I don't fear you. I can make myself disappear or I can enter inside your belly. I can stand between your eyebrows, yet you don't catch a glimpse of me. I am master of my own mind. The bases of power are well developed. I am freed from every bondage. Therefore, I don't fear you, friend. And then Mara, the evil one, realizing that Upalavana knows, knows her, becomes sad and disappointed and disappears. So this sounds like Buddha under the Bodhi tree with Mara appearing and tempting with all sorts of things. But Mara, Mara is kind of a, a stand-in for, our, uh, for our, our own mind. Our, ma, the maras of our mind, <laughs> the fears, the anxieties, the uncertainties. Uh, so one could imagine going out into the wilderness by yourself and meditating and, and, and fear arising, fear taking over. There's another, another story I found that I thought I liked. Um, this is a story about a monk a Chinese monk, Buko Kokushi, um, who was uh, an immigrant from China to Japan at a time when, and when he was in, uh, but when he was in China, there were great wars and militias. And, and the Yuan soldiers were 
uh, going around attacking temples. Now, this was in Japan. That they were going around attacking temples. And mostly what was happening was all the other priests and monks were fleeing to safety. They wouldn't stay in their temples. But Buko stayed in his temple. And one day, the soldiers arrived. And he was sitting, meditating when they arrived. And the soldier came up and pulled out his sword. And Buko just sat there. And he recited this. The five skandhas are empty. There is no ground on which to put a stick. How happy it is to find the subject and object empty. That nothing compares with his, this discovery. Great rarity is the giant sword of Yuan. It is just as if the spring wind is cut off in a flash of lightning. And as in the story with Mara, the soldier with the sword was completely emotionally or psychologically disarmed and physically put down his sword and he became a follower of Buko. So in these, in these stories, uh, one of which is more of a, a psychological thing and one of, one of which is a, maybe you think you can more think of as physical courage. But they both they both met these situations with spiritual courage, residing in their in their beliefs, and stood their ground. This is how it is. I I'm solid in my practice. Nothing can nothing can uh, nothing can shake me. So, um, in some teaching of courage or discussion of courage. Um, courage is interwoven with um, the three essentials of Zen practice. Uh, great faith, great doubt, and great determination. I don't have time to talk about all of those today. I probably can get through great faith and great doubt, so I'll call this part one. Uh, um, and then later on when I have another opportunity, I'll, I'll talk about great determination. But since I love faith, um, I'll start with great faith. Because these, these essential practices are what, what undergird our courage. So when I talked about faith last time, as I said, I talked about it as a verb. Some of the Zen teaching is that it's, it's trust in the three treasures. I think of it more as practicing the three treasures. Uh, practicing with the, with the teacher. Or we say the Buddha, but uh, the teacher. Trust and pr trusting is also a verb. <laughs> so practicing with a teacher, uh, trust in the Dharma that we study, trust in the Sangha as a container in support of our practice. So great, tr great faith believes in, that without doubt, without doubt, you're in, we're all awake. We're all able to awaken. We all have an awakened part of ourselves already, which is there. We are, all, are already Buddha. Developing that comes from practicing. Practicing our practicing the th with the three treasures. And as we as we and the, the way that it happens is that you know we just keep at it. Um, I was thinking about you know when Blake said. You started practicing in 1989. That was very humbling, <laughs> That's because uh, because it just seems like uh, I'm still practicing, uh, and 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 maybe there's a difference, and maybe there's not. Um, but it, I entered 
Um, and I just kept on um, with, the, with practicing the three treasures consistently. The thing that changes over time is the consistency. A lot of us, a lot of, of I, I, let me just say I, uh, started off with, um, I would say, dabbling. Going to this lecture here, that lecture there, reading this book here, that book there, talking to different teachers, um, exp exploring. Um, I learned um, to, re I, I, learned, I learned to say things about Buddhism. <laughs> I could say them. I could say what I heard. Uh, but it wasn't until um, there was a commitment made, some internal commitment made, to be consistent and to really enter. And that entering was a faithing and, a, and was a based on faithing, was based on having a sense getting up, seeing little hints, you know, like the, like the ox peeking around for things and the ox herding pictures, peeking around and gradually with consistent sitting, with starting with a small schedule of sitting and then increasing it, with trying a sashin and then entering it deep and, and then making that a regular part of my practice. Deepening that experiential practice that is great faith great faith in doing that regardless of whether it's convenient regardless of you know whether you have things in your life um, that are important it's it's making in integrating practice in such a way that there is this deeply entering and accepting process and approaching fear that really becomes that really becomes part of your dna it becomes um it becomes how it is for you and just making that commitment and doing that consistently um that that is really um what allows us then to really know ourselves and to develop some confidence about ourselves, to notice that we can do these things, to notice that we do have the ability to, to, to have at least moments of awakening, to, to notice that our emotions aren't kicking us around quite so much. Um, so little by little, we, th we throw ourselves into practice, not with really an entering, it's just with that sense of bodhicitta, the, one, the desire to awaken, the knowing that we can awaken with all beings, the knowing that all of us are supporting each other, all of us. In a sangha, our teachers are supporting us, our sangha is supporting us. The dharma that we study is supporting us. That develops the courage muscle, the courage muscle develops because of the faith we have that no matter what, we, we have the faith in our wholeness. We have the faith in the knowing. We, have, we, don't, have, we don't have a faith really in it. We just experience. It's while we're faithing there, that very, that very ability to hold everything the good, the bad, and the ugly, that is little by little we develop a, 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 kind of, a kind of courageousness of being able to face more and more and hold more and more. And also we, we develop a, an understanding or a deep understanding of our own consciousnesses, how, how they work. Where are we hung up? And only then can we grow. So if we, we have faith in our awakening, or we're faithing our awakening, we're faithing our oneness, our, our universal connection, interconnectivity, uh, we're facing that, 
we're strong enough to be able to look at a way our consciousness works and just be with that and in that transformation is possible. Uh, Katagiri Roshi said about faith, right faith is not waiting until we understand something and then doing it. Faith is to do something even though our consciousness tells us we don't have faith. Even though we don't have right faith, right faith is to do something because it's exactly the total manifestation of the nat ultimate nature of existence. He went on to say, we have to get out of this small well, even if it's only once. This means we develop the courage to be fully vulnerable. He also says, you cannot discriminate between you and faith, you and Zazen. Faith means tranquility and complete tranquility is the source of our existence. Faith in Buddhism is to trust perfect tranquility, imperturbability, which is to trust something greater than just our conceptualization. Tranquility comes up just like spring water from the earth. We already have it underground, regardless of whether we're conscious of it or not. So that's very inspiring for me anyway. We can't, but, but just talking about faith is one-sided. There is no, there is no just faith and tranquility. We don't discover our, our faithing leads us to have courage to face, to, to be with things. But in order to grow and to, to have our courage grow stronger so that we get to the point where we can act from courage, we have to face great doubt. So that's the other side of the coin. There's no great faith without great doubt. In fact, some people say that the root of great faith activates the great ball of doubt. Because as you're, as you're opening, as you're making yourself vulnerable, as you're seeing more, then you confront the inconsistencies of yourself. And you, can and you question what you think you know. You find you're wrong so many times. Um, you have a, a conception of something or yourself or a person or a situation. And then if you're open to being, to explore that, and, and, and be open to that when it comes up, you start to wonder, you, you start to find great doubt. But there also, uh, there's also great doubt in, that just comes up about yourself. This is hard, I don't understand it, I never will. Um, you doubt yourself, you doubt whether or not you're, you really can do this. Are you strong enough? Are you smart enough? Or you do you have enough uh, commitment? Or um, or you just or or just feeling um, that you're caught by your fears. You're you're feeling doubt in your own ability to be courageous. So it really means be being able to have a questions about that and to take it beyond the fear, beyond the uncertainty of doubt. Another, another uh, kind of uh, analogy uh, that's used is uh, looking bravely at ourselves, cracking open the nut of self. Sometimes we talk about um, peeling away the layers of our ego. That's tough, that's tough job. That's scary, that can be scary. Um, how do we do that? How do we, how do, we do that? Does it, is it dramatic? Are we, do we have to courage our way through it because it's, it's gonna be dramatic? Or is it just using, really mind, losing, using mindfulness and just noticing? And often just noticing and entering in and being with, things dissolve. 
They just don't have the power anymore. Just by stepping forward, looking it in the eye, looking, looking, that, looking at that doubt and fear in the eye. Letting that doubt and fear come in, welcoming that doubt and fear as a natural part of our humanity. Hi, doubt and fear, you're back again. Being, being one with it, letting it be one, rather than shoved into some corner of your storehouse consciousness and not wanting to look at it. There's a quote there, apparently not only Buddhists, but uh, Christian meditators and entering contemplation practice have some of the same experiences. There's a quote by St. Teresa Avila of Avila once, and it is of great importance when we begin to practice contemplation not to let ourselves be frightened by our own thoughts. No matter what they are, they are our thoughts. They are our minds, which means they are us. We cannot deal with them as long as we refuse to acknowledge them. Can we question them? And are we ready? to give up everything we know. It makes me think of um, Uchiyama Roshi's opening the hand of thought. You know, I always think of myself when I, uh, one of the characteristic, family characteristic in our family is when you have anxiety, you squeeze your hands together, you know, you, and you find all of a sudden um, you don't even know you're doing it that so so a physical feeling of that tightness getting in touch with your body and how the body is responding um, something's off i don't understand what's off um that that was that understanding having this image of opening the hand of thought was really a very um inspiring for me i literally <laughs> practice opening my hands <laughs> And that literal action of opening my hands, you could say that's couraging, right? That's, that's couraging. I, 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 I hold my hands tight together from when I was very young to be secure. Somehow, if I, if I held on to myself in some way. So opening the hands and letting it in, opening, widening, uh, widening the mind opening the mind wider and wider until it contains everything. And for me, the actual act of opening my hands, as some people might hold that protectiveness somewhere else in their body, tight shoulders or a tight neck or something like that. And then you just, that's why we go to massage, right? We, we, we find our, our tense spots and using those as a guide and being with those, being in your body, uh, being completely in your body and sensing, uh, sensing that fear, sensing that denial, that aversion uh, to being with whatever you're being with. So this, I wanna just distinguish that when I'm talking about doubt, um, it, isn't, it isn't intellectual doubt. Um, that's kind of, it's, it's, uh, it's not that we, most of us don't mind learning something new or having questions about a quote unquote mental construction or mental formation. It's when we incorporate something into who we are and make it part of ourself, that's when um, that's, that's when we get threatened. We get threatened from what is really part of who we are, our worldview. Someone is breaking up our world or saying something to me that makes me uh, uh, feel un uncertain or uncomfortable. So practicing with this, being with it, it is encouraging. I also found it interesting. I just love this <laughs> uh, because it's so Zrinzai. 
Uh, so in a Renzi commentary by E.K. Osho, on the first case of the gateless gate, he says, concentrate your whole self with its 360 bones and 84,000 pores into Mu, making your whole body a solid lump of doubt. Keep digging in, in it day and night without pause. Don't mistake it for nothingness, being or non-being. It must be like a red hot iron ball that you've swallowed, which you will try to vomit out but can't. You must extinguish all the thoughts and feelings that you have cherished until the present. After a period of such efforts, Mu will bear fruit. And inside and out, you will naturally become one. You will become like a dumb man who has a bad dream. You will know yourself and for yourself only. Then the understanding will suddenly break open, astonish the heavens and shake the earth. Well, uh, you know, I, when I read that, I, I actually did think about uh, going to Tassajara and sitting Tangario. Uh, when you go to Tassajara for the first time, you have to spend seven, uh, five days in the Zendo with nothing going, nothing, no, no, talk, no talks, no um, work period. <laughs> you can have meals, but basically... You start at 4.30 in the morning and you finish at 9 at night, something like that, and you're just there for five days. And it seems like you experience every bone <laughs> and every pore and all, and all the things, you know, get tired, more and more tired, and all of, these, all of these visions come and all of these fears come and all of these emotions. Mara visits you regularly. And somehow... You need a lot of faith and a lot of courage to get through that. Not everybody does. You, a lot of there are usually a couple of people in a practice period that leave really early, right, right in the middle of that. That's just more than they can take. But it takes that. It takes faithing and courage, and that's that's the courage we're talking about. So I wanted to. Uh, And by, uh, by reading a poem that I wrote, and I really can't even believe that I wrote it in 1992. I just was really <laughs> like, time, what happened to it? <laughs> um, and it was, uh, I had been having, uh, experiencing uh, in Zazen, a sense of falling. Um, the first session I ever did was... Uh, with Yvonne, Yvonne Rand and um, Blanche Hartman, both of whom are dead now, and Yvonne, uh, Yvonne just died recently. It was a woman's session. And um, I sat there and I literally felt like I was dying. I was falling, I felt nauseous. Um, I, I thought, I, I'm never gonna get through this session. And I went to talk to, uh, Yvonne, and she said, uh, oh, yeah, that's right. That happens sometimes. <laughs> so, but it didn't go away. Uh, I, I, I used to sit in the morning, every morning, uh, when I couldn't go to, when I had my kids and had a hard time getting to morning uh, Zazen, I'd sit every morning at home, and I would feel that, that not all the time, not every time I sat, or I never would have made it, um, but I'd feel it. And then one morning, Something happened. So that's what this poem is. It's, it, I called it another, I really I found it. It wasn't, I couldn't open it in Word because it, so I had to open it in text edit because it was so old. <laughs> so so I, I remembered it, but I uh, clearly hadn't looked at it for a long time. So another visit to the Green Dragon's Cave, it's called, I am trapped as in an elevator descending into the darkness within the confines of this cage. I'm powerless to alter the course. Stony, moist, glistening walls surround me. Terror grips my heart. I descend deeper and deeper in an inexorable progression. I'm completely alone in this no other way. Tears begin to flow, more sadness than fear. Another pilgrimage into the green dragon's cave. 
Is it better to live but one day in the sun or to dwell in eternal moonlight? Enveloped in darkness, the downward movement ceases. No longer caged, I drift into a beckoning warmth. A vision of a female figure hovering just above the water in flowing robes, the essence of tranquility and bliss. Is the choice to remain here to dwell in the cave in quiet meditation, weightless, afloat and float in the colorless sea, or to choose to come alive again with renewed awareness, face the suffering I've died to avoid? I was pretty surprised to find that, <laughs> but um, it, it just fits um, going through a great doubt and, and going through a great doubt of feeling you're going to die, you're just losing it, and then somehow um, staying with it. So, practice, so just the last thing I'm just going to say is, you know, so practicing with date doubt, great doubt requires we step forward in the face of our fears and dwell in the reality of the challenges. Dogen says, one who does not step forward cannot accept the Buddha's teaching. To step, to step forward, we have to let go of ego and fixed ideas. We have to courageously leave home, which means the comfort of a fixed self and all that we carry with it. We have to allow ourselves to be vulnerable. So, questions, and I'm happy to hear your experiences of great faith or great doubt or any questions, please everybody feel free and don't let your uh, lack of uh, social, <laughs> summon up your social courage. It's on good. I invite you to um, raise your virtual hand. You can also type a question in the chat. Please put the word question and then type the question. I'll try to get to you. Uh, I'd first like to call upon uh, Peter Overton to lower his blue hand and um, ask a question. He's not unmiked. Peter, can you unmike yourself? Yes. I'm going to figure out the blue hand thing later. <laughs> yeah, don't worry about that. <laughs> Thank you very much for speaking about this uh, and, and showing us all the ways in which uh, um, courage is necessary uh, in the face of just everyday life. Um, I thought it struck me from the beginning of your talk that the um, that the word courage, the, the, I, think, I believe I'm correct about this, but I'm, that the word courage, its root meaning points to the heart. Yeah. So I've been really thinking about uh, how showing up wholeheartedly with an you know, open heart, mm -hmm. actually the doorway to being able to act in, with courage and openness and trust that you can adapt to whatever shows up. There's adapt and respond to whatever shows up. Mm -hmm. But that piece of bringing your whole heart to the situation in front of you yeah. and so on is really crucial. So thank you very much for that. And I'd be happy to hear your comments. Well, yes, I mean, it, it, it's in, it was interesting to me. As I said, it was interesting to me because when, you know, uh, I was thinking about the <laughs> the tin man who needed who needed a heart or whatever but um the uh the the openness has to come from a place from that place where compassion dwells uh, and and we have to really get that um in a, in order to be skillful in responding I think we have to be open to the interconnectedness of people and the the the, the conditioned way that people be, people act and be sympathetic with that and empathetic with that. Um, and when we act from the heart, 
there's a there's you know we can act courageously but with a certain with 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 it doesn't feel like a harsh response mm -hmm. feels like a loving response and at least in my worldview angry responses or angry courage doesn't always do it and certainly from a zen perspective the kinds of things we have to encounter ourselves that open-hearted way of coming forward stepping forward in the face of various kinds of challenges is really critical yeah thank you very much i'd like to uh, invite kelsey byrne churlin to ask a question Um, hi, Jerry. Thanks so much for your talk. Um, I um, noticed while you were talking that I was feeling very encouraged. <laughs> um, and I was just curious if uh, you had any thoughts or kind of dug into sort of the like transitional properties of courage and by seeing others' courage, how we sort of feel encouraged ourselves. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's that's like uh, we're talking about uh, faith in the sangha. You know, great faith in the sangha. That's that that it's possible. You know, that that other PC, other people, uh, and you're with other people, and 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 you're supported by them, and you see change in people. You know, you get to know people very intimately in the sangha, especially when we sit in the zendo day after day and do the long sashins you you don't even have to ask you don't have to ask them too much you start to get to know them and see everybody see and watch everybody develop even just in within a sashin but also um just going forward in life so you, you start to see people have that strength that that's that spiritual strength spiritual courage particularly uh, but it manifests in the other other forms of courage too but yeah they, it's very inspirational and supportive to have to have people around you who are who are in the same container i always think of us as in noah's ark together <laughs> somehow surviving the waves and not knowing where we're going to land um but we can do it uh with each other's support I'd like to invite Heiko to unmute himself and ask a question. Thank you. Uh, Jerry, I wanted to revisit the very last line of your poem. Um, it seemed to have more meaning in my mind. Uh, and the line, if you could look at it, said something like, the things I've died to avoid, mm -hmm. or died trying to avoid. And, and my it seemed to me to encapsulate the freedom that we get by encouraging into the things that we avoid. But if you could read that again, please. Uh, I'll just read the last, uh, the last verse, I guess. Is, is the choice to remain here, to dwell in the temple cave in quiet meditation, weightless and afloat in the colorless sea, or to choose to come alive again? with renewed awareness, face the suffering I have died to avoid. Right, so in avoiding suffering, it suggests that we die. Uh, and if that was your point, uh, and it, even if it wasn't, uh, yes, I wanted to, it was. yeah. <laughs> so if you would talk a little bit more about what dying and uh, how we save ourselves in that moment. Well, we don't, we don't save ourselves because when we die, it means like we give up, we give up um, ourselves. We, 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 we become selfless. And that feeling of selfless feels like dying. Everything we hold on um, to every way we identify, we identify ourself. And our self is gone. We experience, when we experience the walls and the, the barriers falling away, in, and it feels 
it physically feels like dying or, or, or dropping down into nothingness. And it, and it, it's, it's that, uh, it's that state of being in emptiness without a self, without a, with a self that's just part of the big picture, but not the self that we've, that we hold on to. It's not the ego self at all. That's a powerful thing. And that really is a death. It's a kind of death. Yeah. So that dying to life. And I was uh, struck by dying to the death of my own mind coverings. Yeah. Where the mind covering is a death of its own and the dropping of that is a life of its own. So we've gone through, uh, and I suppose we're still dropping. <laughs> Thank you, Jerry. <laughs> exactly. I mean, it's funny, as I said, it's as real to me now as it was then. Um, because it, because I think Reb Anderson said, I, I said this before, he, he used to say that um, science tells us that uh, we only are aware of 5% of our subconscious. And if you practice for 30 years, at the time he was practicing, I think I have, now I understand 7.5% of my, <laughs> my subconscious. So there's all kinds of stuff there that's us that we may not even see that, um, that we don't have a clue about. So the, the surprises and the letting go is endless. Um, uh, as our last question, a quick question, a quick answer, uh, Karen Sunheim, and I invite you to unmute yourself and ask a quick question. Hi, um, I'm not Karen Sunheim, I'm Nancy Sue, but I'm with Karen at the moment. Uh, thank you so much, Jerry. Um, you've actually encouraged and are encouraging me to ask a question. I'm usually one who doesn't. Uh, Mara usually visits me regularly. <laughs> <laughs> of uh, not wanting to be so vulnerable, but um, I really took in what you said so deeply that I decided to raise my hand, so thank you. <laughs> well, great. Yeah. The question I have is about, uh, in addition to encouraging and facing, how does right effort also fit into what you've been speaking about today? Well, it, it speaks it very much so, and in fact, that's like the next talk, <laughs> but... That, that I said I didn't have time for today. But yes, it very much, it comes out of there. You know, how do we, when we kind of, when we have a deeper understanding and we're acting um, in a more interconnected way with the ego not, not dragging us around and, the, and, and, then the, and, and an openness, that openness to see possibility. So to, to find a more, um, appropriate response a more skillful response because we have more information mm -hmm. we have a deeper understanding so the, the the action that's necessary comes out of first of all the immersion in not knowing and then the openness of the field of possibility mm -hmm. so the field opens and then we we kind of um we kind of intuitively start to be able to respond um, in that way. Um, I w is that is that so? That's so. It definitely right effort. It's just born of a greater wisdom. The wisdom that comes from this effort. And does that also include like dropping the self in that moment? Absolutely. Well, yes. I mean. You know, if you're doing selfless effort, then that's, if it feels selfless, mm -hmm. you know, you're coming from a place that is including everything and everyone. And so your separate, separateness is not what's, what's leading you, it's your interconnectedness is leading you. And that actually feels very good <laughs> to be able to do that. Blake, when you there are a couple people who are raising their hands that don't always raise their hands and i would like to give them a chance if that's okay um that is okay with me yes let's um, do that okay <laughs> thank you for the voice from nowhere um so philip uh shirard shirard please unmute yourself and ask a question
Does that work? Am I unmuted? Okay. Um, I, Jerry, I want to thank you very much for your talk. Um, I tried to just talk about um, in the Dokusan yesterday with Sojin about self-doubt. And he, had, he tried to get me to address it in terms of understanding how much I, quote unquote, have accomplished in my life and lifetime and Zen and Zen practice, but it really didn't address it. And what you've addressed in terms of finding courage, I find very, very helpful. Um, and it's another tool that I can use in terms of understanding myself the 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 what is it um, the transition from delusion and self doubt I'm trying to navigate that yeah it's it's um it's difficult I can't really get a handle on it yeah, but no. you've given me some tools and I thank you very much. For your talk. Okay. Well, I just tell you, you know, you, I, I, I'm glad that you feel that you have a, you know, some things or, or th things to do, but really getting used to, but the real, the real challenge is um, just really, really being with that. Really, really being with that. Um, you know, as a doctor, you are trained, you were trained to, uh, know everything <laughs> you know that patients ask you you're not going to say gee i don't know it's kind of empty and uh, <laughs> i really don't know there's no real answer no you couldn't live like that so you're trained you're trained yourself to be competent to appear competent to come forward as competent you know and and to have a belief in yourself be, that's part of the training so what zen is you know i always say my training was to learn not to be a doctor you know in certain ways, you have to unlearn that. You know, you're not the authority. You're not the one who knows. And that's, uh, that's a humbling thing, and it's also um, essential. So I'm really glad you're, um, you're there right now. It's a great place to be. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Simba. Gary, good morning. Hi. Thank you for yeah, thank you for your talk. It was for me. It was very relevant and uh, timely. One thing that I've been struggling with myself uh, with my practice has been with accepting. And what I mean by accepting is uh, when I'm sitting, uh, whether I'm having pain in my legs or if it's, if it's even if it's with concentration, has been just to accept things as they are. And so your talk today um, was actually relevant because this morning I woke up reflecting on some of the challenges I've been facing with my practice. And one of the thoughts that I had in my head is I realized that today I was one day older in terms of my physical body. And also my thoughts uh, were also one day older. Um, however, looking on the other side, you also realize that um, that oldness or that death that experiences my body or my thoughts or my spirit, there was also a birth of new thoughts as well as uh, a birth of new cells yeah. as well as my spirit. So it helped me sort of um, see the other side of the coin in terms of understanding the life and death. And uh, for me, my challenge has been accepting death or accepting the daily death or the daily um that I face, uh, I struggle a lot because I try to seek and crave uh, life or rebirth. Um, so your talk was very, very relevant and helpful and helped me understand um, much more clearly uh, why, why it's important to accept death as well as life as well. Uh, so I'd love if you could please share a little bit about uh, that, that acceptance of death. I know you alluded to it a little bit earlier or just to shed a little bit of light around that. Yeah, I think we, we think about the, the quote-unquote great death, right? The final death, and we don't know what happens after that. Um, but there are death, but death, death comes, oh, 
in a way, death comes over and over, right? That's what you're finding. That um, that we arise as a, you know, we 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 are a certain being, but it's not a fixed being. So that being um, that we were, you can maybe you can remember it, but now um, being open and and questioning and growing because of the courage to face all of that, you actually grow into another being. And then that being uh, runs into runs into a wall. <laughs> so it's not a, it's not a, a one time. It's this this feeling of of the you know it's it's a feeling of imp impermanence is basically birth and death in every moment, right? So uh, we say that, but how do we live it? How do we live it day to day? How do we live it month to month? And that's what you're talking about, grappling with. And the thing to do with that is courage it, you know? Just, okay, this is what's going on today. I'm feeling like that person that I was um, is being challenged. That person I thought I was. but it was just delusion. So now I see something else. That's just, it's the way that we practice going, going forward with our lives. We birth and death all the time. <laughs>